Hello. Check, check, testing. Hello, check, testing, testing. Hello, everybody. How are you all doing? Let's get started with our webinar replay. Hey, everybody. We are so excited here today to have Alexandra with us. It's Alex Sandra. I think you, they're, or you were saying you make a little bit of a break in between there. And, and your last name, is it pronounced Guerrera? Or is it Gera? I sometimes it's, it, it could be either way. Yeah, no, it's the it's the latter. So Gera is uh, worn Got Spanish. It. Gera. All right, Gera, Alexandra Gera. And um, I have not met before. We have not met, so this is going to be fun. We're just going to chat with each other. So uh, don't 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 be nervous. And in the background, Mark and Arib will will scroll through your different pages and, and have some things on the screen. If anything pops up on the screen that you're interested in talking about, just bring it up and we can stop the screen and, and chat about it. For the audience, put some questions in. Sometimes you guys get shy. Get your fingers typing and put in some questions for Alexandra. And uh, I'm going to give just a brief announcement. Um, Next week sometime, we're going to uh, schedule another webinar where I'm just going to come on just to give a brief update. We haven't done one for EAT generally in probably three months. So that'll come on the calendar. And it's just going to be Mark and Areeb and Sierra and I giving an update. And that's not yet scheduled. So we'll, we'll send out an email that will announce it and put it on social media and so on. So just a brief announcement for that. And that done. It's time to get going with Alexandra. Um, so again, we haven't met, but uh, I, uh, I'm excited about Nori. And why don't we start there? Why don't you start by talking about the Nori Carbon Removal Marketplace and tell us where our Nori comes from uh, and what where that word what that word means. Sure. So, um, hi, I'm Alexandra Guerra. I'm one of the co-founders of Nori. So I've been here um, since the beginning of the of the company, which started about four years ago. Um, actually, it's our anniversary month. So um, we, uh, m myself and my co-founders, are environmentalists, and um, you know, in different aspects, whether we're from, coming from tech or or otherwise or policy. Uh, we wanted to see something that would help scale the removing CO2 from the atmosphere as a way of reversing emissions, right? So a lot has been focused and a lot of work is being done in decarbonizing our energy grid, our transportation infrastructure. Um, but yet, even with all of that, we have emitted 1.5 trillion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution. That's a lot, 1.5 trillion tons, um, give you scales, it's, it's just a massive amount. So, and we emit about 32 gigatons uh, every year. So my co-founders and I um, have been, uh, came together about four years ago and there you go, consensus, here's our timeline, it's perfect. So the consensus blockchain um, for social impact hackathon was uh, when we came together and tried out this idea and I was working actually in um, solar energy at Southern California Edison um, on clean energy and that was my entire space was always on climate and energy production. I'm an engineer by background um, and we did this five week hackathon to test out the idea and for me I was testing out the, both the idea and the team and I had been an entrepreneur on the side for a while trying to build up a business around climate change and nothing really stuck. So after three years of doing that at SCE, I just kind of thought, I'm going to climb this corporate social ladder. Then the team got together and we did this hackathon and we won it, uh, the hackathon for energy and environment. Um, and then I quit my job and we all kind of just founded Nori and went like running as quickly as possible. We published a white paper. Yeah, that was well, that was the first time I met those guys, that photo, and also my, my co-founders, um, including some that, that joined later. Um, so yeah, we are focused on building a marketplace that will help prove financial um, 
uh, incentive for anyone anywhere around the world to remove carbon from the atmosphere and get paid for doing that. Um, this can be natural systems or more industrial type ways uh, to do this. So right now we're working with farmers. It was the it was you know out of all the ways to remove CO2, we decided there you go. Starting in 2018, we uh, finally published our croplands methodology, um, which helps any farmer who's switching over to regenerative agricultural practices, um, which results in CO2 being sequestered from the atmosphere and stored in soil can get paid for doing that. And then we're kind of hoping this is like going to be um, starting a flywheel effect where a farmer can see that, you know, there are farmers in Norway getting paid for carbon uh, and that they can get additional income and make that practice changes because it costs a lot of money to change the way you farm. So I can keep going, but I think that's, that's enough to stop, no, that's, you know, ask your own question. That's, that's a great, great place to start. Um, so on the crop, on that side, let's stay with the ag side for a second because I'm a farmer. I've been a farmer for uh, many, many years and, and have a ranch in, in Colorado. And we do farm and ranch what we believe is fairly regeneratively. So, but we didn't originally. We didn't. We didn't years ago. So, is it is it something gets, that gets paid to farmers uh, based on some metrics that you've created? And they and and you apply those metrics to their uh, farming operations. So so just again an overview. How does that work for a farm? Yeah, man. Whoever is controlling this screen is awesome. And like navigating to the page, I would love to keep scrolling down there. Um, there's a section right below there that perfect. So first, farmers um, provide information about their land, and they might highlight this on. Um, Google Maps, where their fields are, what they planted, when, what type of fertilizer, what type of irrigation, what type of tillage, non-intensive, etc. Um, I mean, I think you understand this is like you would need to have good record of what you planted, where and when. Um, and uh, it takes anywhere from two to six months to do this record collection to create the project. Once that's done, once we have that information, step two is we send it to an independent third party um, called Soil Metrics. Soil Metrics is a tool that was funded actually in Colorado by the CSU. It was funded by the USDA and developed at CSU. Um, and it's now spun out as its own private entity. Um, but it's a model that takes in information about how did you manage your land and then estimates how much um, is emitted, how the greenhouse gas emissions and CO2E uh, from that land over a period of time. So we use them as a model to baseline what it was like before you adopted practices, as well as what does it look like after you've adopted new practices, you know, reducing the intensity of your tillage, planting cover crops, um, et cetera. And then we also have the third step is uh, farmers have to get a third party verifier to verify three key things, which is one that uh, that farmer has the legal rights to list the land because you're going to sign a contract with Nori saying you're going to maintain certain practices or do certain things and provide data every year. Um, two, that the project isn't listed anywhere else. We're not double selling these credits. And then three, they review the data. They do an audit to make sure that the data provided, you know, is accurate. And then we, and then four is we end up, we end up creating these, issuing these digital certificates. Uh, for every ton, we call them NRTs, for every ton of CO2 removed and stored in the atmosphere, um, stored in soil, excuse me. <clears throat> and then five, we sell those to customers. Cool. So how many, um, what, what's the metrics on how many people you've worked with, how many are in the program, and so on? Yeah, at uh, nori.com forward slash registry, um, there we have a list of all the projects that we've worked with. Uh, we are right now on our sixth um, supplier. So if you wanted to navigate to registry at the end, instead of generate, there you go. Um, this is how every webinar should be done. I'm just, this is fantastic. <laughs> I've never had someone do this for me. Um, so if you scroll down, you can see in that first table, um, all the farmers that we've been able to uh, help support. And so Harborview Farms, Trey Hill sold 14,000. The next project was 22,000 tons, et cetera. We sold out of five projects and we're currently selling um, from Adam Ulrich there at the bottom. Um, and he's got about 10,000 NRTs left to sell. I think today we sold, yeah, about 4,584. 4, so he's got 10,000 left. 
Um, and we're growing. We have a lot more farmers who are, who are in the pipeline in the, in the stages of getting verification. They, you know, submitted all their information and now they're getting a third party verifier to, to go through that, you know, checklist of things to make sure that they can be listed. Very cool. Um, we didn't happen. You didn't, you didn't go to either, uh, of the permaculture one or permaculture two in, in San Diego, did you? And maybe we met there. Um, no, I did not. Yeah. No, sounds nice though. Anyway. I've been wanting to do yeah. like a permaculture class, and I just haven't gotten around to it. But it's one of those things on the bucket list of things. When I yeah. when I have enough money to like buy land, like then it's just gonna be a whole you thing. Get your <laughs> so uh, another cue earlier, you mentioned Southern California. You worked for Southern California Edison. Are you a Southern Californian? Let's go back in your history a little bit. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Sure. Um, I'm actually right now in Miami, Florida, which is where I'm from originally. And my whole, it's kind of full circle. Um, my whole journey started here because I was born and raised um, to Cuban immigrants uh, in Miami. And when I was 15, the, um, the conversation started about global warming. Climate change wasn't quite the term at the time. Uh, we were seeing global warming and sea level rise, and we had just come from a drought, and I don't know, I was just very in tune with nature, and it was very nerdy. Um, and this whole concept of global warming and sea level rise really scared me, it startled me. Um, and so, you know, when I was 17, I saw a professor from Columbia University in New York City talking about this um, a technology called direct air capture where they had artificial artificial trees some technology that when the air blew over it, it could sequester co2 and then absorb as much co2 in one area as a thousand trees and i said i, I want to study that and i like that's what we're going to do um and focus on climate change and removing co2 from the atmosphere um and i got into columbia which was which is not that easy and so it was wonderful and we had financial aid because they have a great endowment program program um, financially program and then I studied with that professor um, I didn't end up actually liking the chemistry like it was like a certain type of chemistry I didn't like I ended up going completely into thermodynamics and loved studying um, heat transfer uh, mass transfer and I went and I got my I uh, started a PhD at UC Irvine and then I just you know at that point now years later I'm, I'm feeling a lot of urgency around climate change and I dropped out and I worked for Southern California Edison I got recruited and I thought I'm going to do this and I'm going to start doing, working on solutions today because we can't wait for some brilliant PhD person to like do four years of research and come up with something else. So um, then I went, I mean, from L.A., so Miami, New York, L.A., and then I quit that job to start Nori in Seattle. And then right before the pandemic, I moved back to Miami to be closer to my family. So did you? truly get there before the pandemic so you were kind of lucky that you you got there i did and it was so funny because i um my colleague didn't really didn't want me to leave because he was he still feels very strongly about um uh, co-location and i said I, i'm sorry i just like i got to like this it wasn't the right fit for me seattle and i really missed my roots and my home and i had been away for a long time and i went back and it was March 1st I got back, and then on March 4th, everybody went remote, and it made no difference yeah. that I was the one person who was remote. Um, and it still makes very little difference, especially now the whole world went remote. So it worked out in my favor, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, we have a lot of commonalities, so I'll throw out the first one that most people will not get. You are a, a, a co anteater And so... Blah, blah, blah. So, so I, uh, I, I, I have my bachelor's from Irvine, and, uh, nice. and then um, I was mentored by a couple of guys. So I have a, a double major from Irvine in engineering and biology, and almost all of my, my classmates were pre-med. <laughs> so I was the rare person that was really only interested in ecology, and so two of the profs and and, and ecology became really good friends and, and then they were very helpful in getting me into um, to, to Scripps Institute of Oceanography in San Diego and specifically I worked on a project that was funded by Southern California Edison and San Diego Gas and Electric looking at the effects of temperature primarily but also chemistry so I actually focused on the chemistry side eventually 
of the effluent from power plants into the ocean through through the the, the process of cooling um, the power plants. And then what people didn't realize, and this is a long time ago, but at that time they would allow water to be discharged during cleanings of the power plants that was that was as much as 15 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the seawater that it was encountering. And there were massive die-offs that would occur during those um, during those discharges. And they were usually from like two in the morning till four in the morning and they thought they could get away with nobody seeing them. Anyway, bottom line is that um, they got caught essentially and, and, and it, it did lead to some major changes and the power plants are not allowed to do that any longer. But my lab was at the Carlsbad um, SDG&E power plant where I had um, a, a, a built a building that was like this metal shed out on a point to where I could sample and, and, and do things out on where the water discharged. I'm a surfer also, grew up in Southern California. And so, um, you know, the beach right there was right, you know, I walked across the uh, 101 and I was at the beach. And so it was very cool. And uh, so we're co-anteaters and, uh, and and I also was, um, was a, uh, uh, SC, uh, you know, SCE funded researcher. They provided funds. I never even interacted with them. I think I don't know how the joint program with with SDG and E worked because my interaction was almost always with SDG and E. So. And then anyway, I I left cool. there and went up to to Idaho because I wanted to get out of Southern California. I was I was a little bit tired of the big city and everything that was occurring in that way, and I was able to get a, P, a PhD there also in, in freshwater ecology in a whole different kind of environment and then ultimately ended up here in Colorado where I've been for um, a lot most of my life now for so it was cool that's cool. anyway yeah. um, it's interesting to think because um, when I was working at SCE and I was living in Huntington Beach at the time uh, and, and I went to I went I, I went to Fountain Valley High School so. Oh, okay, so yeah, but so but um, one of the things was that they they you can't uh, just discharge the water right into the local waterways, um, and I I guess I you know just being young and ignorant I don't think about like how, what was the how did we get to that conclusion like what was the things that could, there was probably someone who had to do research and like do a lot of convincing and sharing of data to get people to not do a thing uh, and to recognize that it was harmful. Yeah, and I think I was one of those. And I actually have a number of published articles that I get more requests for today than I've ever gotten, which is very encouraging uh, about what those impacts were. I was also an activist. And, and when they built the San Onofre, so Fountain Valley, and you, if, if you didn't go away, Fountain Valley is immediately adjacent to, to Huntington Beach. And my high school was literally across the street from it was Huntington Beach. So I only lived two and a half miles from from the pier at Huntington. So I, that's where I would surf, or I would surf at 17th Street, which was up the, up the way a little bit. But anyway, bottom line is on the temperature side, um, when nuclear plants started to come in, and so San Onofre was the first of those, um, they were gonna discharge water at even higher temperatures. So I got, um, I handcuffed myself to the gate of San Onofre power plant with a number of other people stopping the construction traffic from coming into it. And we all got arrested and that became front page news in the LA Times um, back when I was in high school. And, uh, and so, you know, we were activists at that time and it was real clear from surfing when they would do these discharges because the water is always warmer at beaches around power plants. And so that's what we went to to surf because water there's cold. People ever think Southern California, it's warm water. It's never really warm in Southern California. Not like Miami, for example. So we would go to warmer places, but I would see, or I'd feel it even when they do these discharges that fish would be dying. You'd see it right in the water. And you'd see that it, it didn't take much to look and see what the issues were. And uh, so anyway, that, that, that yeah. was a long time. That was, that was in the 70s. So, Impressive. Uh, a while yeah. ago. Um, anyway, um, what is so? What is nori? Is 
that a is that a Native American word? Is it? I don't, what's the genesis of the word? It, it's, it's a seaweed. Um, it's a seaweed you eat in sushi. Ah. Yeah. Ah. When we wow. um, okay. I mentioned that hackathon right after the hackathon. We had you know decided we were to go through with creating the company, and so then we did additional couple workshops, like hour long workshops that our uh, CEO co-founder Paul led us through like a mood board, like what were some of the things that we wanted to, feelings we wanted to elicit with, with regard to climate change in our company. And we wanted to focus more on the hopeful things uh, as opposed to like the dread and the doom and the gloom. Uh, we wanted to make people feel like there was agency, light, something light and, and nature based. And it, the whole exercise ended up us having like different ecosystems and one of them was oceans. And then, you know, someone said oyster and I said, no, and then someone said nori, and then we were all, we all kind of said, yeah, nori, that's a that's a nice one, and that's what stuck. And it was cute, just cute name. Where uh, where'd you live when you were at Irvine? Because you were a grad student there. You must have lived off campus somewhere. Yeah, probably somewhere I lived, cheap. I lived in like actually, I was a, a grad student. I was um in Park West. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um. Or, I can't even remember. This is so bad. Like this is the inform I don't even remember my addresses. I think the other day I had to verify where I had lived previously. Like um, I can't remember three years back. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, um, it's changed. It's changing all the time. So when I went there, a lot of people don't know this, but the the original Planet of the Apes movie, Planet of the Apes movie, was filmed on a UC yeah. Irvine campus and. At that time, there was one loop road around with all the buildings that are on the inside, which actually that hasn't changed much. That's still no. the same. The eucalyptus trees were tiny, you know, with, with you know, stems like this, and now they're like this. But uh, uh, there also was just no development around there. I mean, it was like in the middle of nowhere. You were going out into the country to be, to be, at, the, to be at the campus. So. Yeah. Um, so let's go back to your youth again. and. Tell us someone who had an impact on your life when you were before college, let's say high school age, because you said you, you were really enamored at 15 with some things that were climate change related, other than your parents. So either a person or persons who really had impact on them. I gotta be honest, I, I, there are two, um, and they were both my science teachers. One was my seventh grade science teacher and one was my freshman high school science teacher. So. Miss Santos in seventh grade and Mr. Uh, Beltran as when I was a freshman. And I don't know, I just, I, I enjoyed the subject and they were just people and individuals who saw that I was passionate or just interested and that there was, an, I don't know, an interest beyond the normal. And they fostered that like any, you know, any farmer of, I guess teachers are like farmers of, of children's minds, right? And you just kind of pass it off. Um, and they really helped to, um, I don't know, encourage that curiosity. Uh, and I loved it. Like I, I really, having really great teachers meant everything. Otherwise you don't, how do you get curious about anything? And then how do you feel inspired and passionate? And, and like you have like empowerment to do something about it. So teachers, high school and middle school teachers. So same for me, like I, like I told you, they were very important. Mm -hmm. um, let's take us forward till today. Who would be somebody that that you really look at as a hero that that's out there in the in the either let's say the, the carbon world or the the regenerative ag or regenerative living world or whatever? Is there several names that you can give us? Hmm. I don't, I don't know. Like there are a couple that are coming to mind, but I think it's just like, cause they're easy to come to mind. Like they're, they're well known, like Paul Hawken, um, okay. uh, Paul Stamets, Paul's apparently <laughs> around the world. Um, but well, I I, and I don't think like, for example, I don't think Stamets is that well known. I mean, Paul Hawken obviously is, but, and Stamets is a friend of mine. He's been a speaker here. So, um, oh, but, but he, 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 he wouldn't consider himself, even really that well. You you studied that area well enough to know. Um, well, do you know well, you know do you know of Elaine Ingham? Do you know Elaine Ingham, who's soil yeah. scientist? You would you'd really enjoy her. She's somebody that you would 
Um, so how about let's let's change it. Let's change it to something you've read recently um, that has greatly influenced you. A book, uh, a website, a, a blog. Well, um, okay. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm filtering through which ones are probably more appropriate for this, for this audience, right? Because I'll read things about like behavior psychology. Um, but I really like, uh, so even within that realm, Brene Brown. I think Brene Brown, um, because it's, it's, we're humans, right? We have wonderful ideas and we're um, sparked by curiosity to learn more about science and to better our worlds and be innovative. But ultimately we're humans and so how we are able to manage our own emotions be self-aware and to communicate with others and work well together is is a huge part of what makes i think uh, a society successful and so most of my time because I, I get to touch so much on the technical within work most of my time outside of work is looking more at the like human aspect like what is it that i can do to um, be braver with vulnerability and not have shame and communicate these things more clearly or be honest with them about to myself so that I can show up as a better whole human being uh, at work uh, and also at home at the dinner table with my family. So um, I don't know if you're familiar with Brene Brown. Are you? Yeah, familiar, but not not as much as, as I probably will be after this. So I'll probably yeah, do some she's, more research. She's really well known. She does um, uh, research um, on uh, vulnerability and shame and how it affects and like how it comes up how it affects uh just all of us like how it affects our own trauma responses how we relate with other people um and then you know it's interesting because a lot of this to me is providing new words to a thing that you you knew was there but you if you didn't have the the words to describe it you wouldn't be able to have a conversation about it so gravity you know, if, if you didn't have the word for gravity and understand that concept, it'd be very difficult to talk about it with someone else. And people like Brene Brown, I find, are starting to really hone in on what are these things that we kind of have a feel for that exist and giving them names. And then that gives us the power to talk about it and evolve past it. So, so I told you about the fact that I was an activist, and I, I think I still am to some extent, but maybe it was a lot more of one when I was younger. One of the things that's a little discouraging to me with people under, let's say, 25 today, I, there's no magic to that age, but is that they are not as active in terms of protesting and others as I, I think my age group was. One, am I right about that? And if I am, why? Why do you think that's the case? Oh, well, here, well, I mean, because I, because I'm getting into your age. There, so. <laughs> I mean, I'm not uh, the person to like the authority to respond to this, but I'll tell you my opinion or what I think. Oh, just, it's, it's, yeah. I want your opinion, just your opinion. Yeah. That's all. I Please. think, um, I mean, first of all, total different time, right? In the 70s, um, anti war. I think there was also like a lot of psychedelics. And I don't think that was a bad thing, honestly. Um, I just, it's a whole different time politically. Uh, and then now, I think we do see a lot of protests. I mean, we saw a lot of protests, um, especially at the start of the pandemic. And before that, we were seeing a lot of climate protests. Um, I just don't, I don't know. I don't know the numbers, so I can't be like, oh, that's like actually true, but it might be that the media doesn't cover it, um, or we're just, it's more normal, and so people don't make such a big deal, like, oh, there's another protest. Um, so, I, I don't know that I agree we're protesting less. I no, think there's a lot going on across the board. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, changing back to more on your side, tell us about a tool. So it could be an internet related tool. It could be a tool in your house that you've started to use over the last year that you never even knew about before that, let's say, that you really would like to share. Okay, tell other people because they could use it. And you're an internet based kind of company, so maybe it's internet related, but it could be something else. In the last year, I have to have been using this. Is that the question? Uh, I mean, it doesn't have to be. Yeah, I mean, something in the recent past, just so that it's something a little bit times relevant. I'm gonna look. So we've had speakers that. 
Yeah. yeah, we've had speakers that have talked about that are, you know, in the ground farmers who have said, hey, it's this kind of a fork, a broad fork, for example, that I never even knew existed. We've had a lot of other speakers that have said it's a, it's this internet tool or that tool or whatever. Just, just anything yeah. that you've started to use. Sure. So, um, I like this tool called Data Studio. It's by Google. So yeah. it's datastudio.google.com. Um, and you can connect it to any spreadsheet and it'll allow you to share um, information from like, so actually if you go to the registry page um, in that second section, there's a link there and you'll see, um, yeah, there you go, NRT sales with the fingers. <laughs> um, so this is a data studio dashboard that I was able to create that connects to our private um, spreadsheets, but then shares an, you know, an anonymized version publicly, uh, how many NRTs we sold, what was the price, where were they retired, et cetera. And I, and I love it. It's a free tool. Um, and I constantly, based off of people's feedback on terms of what they're looking for, they would like to know more about this in Nori, um, how much was sold or where, I just I constantly add to this, this dashboard in those pages. That is a great one because I've not heard of it. You can already see by looking at this page that it combines a spreadsheet, it, it combines visuals, it combines all kinds of things. And so Mark, yeah, oh, he's brought it up now. Data, well, it's, he didn't bring it up. That it, you can see it in the URL here, everybody. There's datastudio.google.com, and then all the information about the the Nori sheet that Mark's showing here. Yeah, that's a good one. No, no one's told us about that one before. Okay, so cool. That, that's a really good one. Um, um, so now I'll go back to a little bit more personal. And this one's sometimes the toughest question I ever asked. By the way, I stole this from a guy named John Lee Dumas, who's a podcaster. He teaches about podcasting. He's a really good friend of mine. He does a podcast called Entrepreneur on Fire. And it's every day. He's done it like, I don't know, 7,000 straight. No, not that many. Um, yeah, close. 7,000 straight days. Because that would be like, almost 20 years no not that long he's doing it he's done it about 10 so that's three three thousand six hundred straight days yeah. something like that um anyway tell us about something that's happened in your life that when it happened it seemed really negative to you and yet now as you look back on it it actually turned out to be something that had a good outcome from it A little bit of a you know question to think about. So don't. There's a couple. I'm just trying to figure out which one to share. Um. Yeah. Right. Let's. I'm. I'm. I tend to go on the side of super candid and authentic. So, um, if you actually exit out of this photo and on the left corner there was like a black and white photo. Yeah. So um, Alden Donnelly there in the photo, she's the only other woman in that photo, uh, is one of the founders of Nori. And um, she's one of my favorite people in the whole world. Uh, she's brilliant um, and really has like, is the reason we started in soil and started working with farmers and has been working in um, the carbon markets for over 20 years. And so when I started Nori, um, my role, and still it's quite ambiguous because I, I do lots of, I kind of, like a linchpin type of person i just like fill in the gaps and help things move along but it's not quite clear what i do um but i know i do a lot and it's and it's very helpful and impactful um and in that journey of trying to figure it out um you know we had i had put together a big event within the first six months of our company founding that was helpful and then i thought okay well as an engineer like maybe i'll help out with method methodology and all is was our like key stakeholder in that development. We just, we couldn't, we had a hard time communicating. It was very difficult. Um, and I think in that, like around month nine or like right after a year of founding Nori, I had to take like a week off because I felt super burnt out. And I'm just super grateful to Alden because, you know, she's only just a representation of something that like she helped me. She was like an ally in helping me understand maybe what I needed to face about where my, where I really wanted to be working in terms of Nori and how I could, how I could contribute. And I took some time off and I thought, oh, maybe this isn't for me. And I really thought like, maybe I, maybe I made a mistake, like quitting my job and starting this company. 
Um, and it, in that one week, I felt very fearful. And uh, but I took it off, and then I came back, and it felt like a whole. And I sat down with Alden, and you know, we started brainstorming like what are new ways that we could work together. And uh, to, we needed a lot of help on the sales side. And I said, yeah, I think we can help with that. And it's been awesome. Like, I mean, and then Alden and I became like really, really good at working together to put big proposals together for supplies to sell to buyers. And um, so it seemed like the end of all time. And it seemed like me and Alden would never get along. And she's still one of my favorite human beings in the whole world. And right. very few people I think that highly of. So that, that's awesome. I got to ask you this one just because we were talking about it before we started. There's an artist, um, a Grammy-winning artist that, that whose name I'm forgetting, and Mark can, or Reed go to it on the page, that you guys uh, have worked with, and I've not heard of her. Tell us about, here we go, Imogene Heap. Imogene Heap, yeah, she's um, written a few. Or Imogen. Imogen, yeah, Imogen. Um, she's written it there. I think that actually goes to a podcast episode where we had her on, um, or no, maybe we need to fix that link. Um, cause we had her come on the podcast, the reversing climate change podcast and talk about what we did. Um, and she, so she's, uh, really wanted, I wait, first of all, back up. Are you familiar with NFTs and the art space? Yes. Okay. Yeah. A little bit. Yes. Okay. So for those who maybe, aren't, maybe explain, maybe explain yeah. it for the audience a little. Yeah. yeah. Why don't you do that? So for, for those who aren't familiar with NFT is what stands for a non-fungible, non-fungible token. Tokens being some type of crypto token that's traded on the blockchain, et cetera. It can't, it's very authentic. You can't replicate it. Um, and so, but it's not used, it's not like a cryptocurrency. That's non-fungible part. Um, so anyways, NFTs are now used to represent um, the uh, most authentic way of, of of transferring art. So if I give you a, like Imogene, sell a song sample that she wrote and sold it as an NFT, it, you can prove that you own that um, rights to that and no one can reuse that. Um, and there's just by way of the blockchain being what it is, immutable, there's no way to transfer it. So uh, lots of people in the art space, we have a lot of people um, now in the NFT space, actually three of those are in the NFT space on the screen um are working with nori like blind boxes too uh helping artists to sell their nfts but then attach some type of fund to pay for removing carbon from the atmosphere as a way of addressing climate change it's like mobilizing the art world to help address climate change and imogene was actually the first she came to us she found my colleague paul on twitter sent him a, a DM on Twitter and said like, hey, would love to support Nori's work. And then they got on a Zoom call and it all happened rather quickly. And then after that, we just kept getting more and more interest from people in the NFT space um, who want to attach impact. Because I mean, what is art? It, art is, is something that evokes a feeling. And, um, you know, there's, there's some pretty negative feelings with regard to climate change. And there's carbon impacts that goes with minting NFTs and maintaining the blockchain. And so people are aware of this. And so they're trying to package in, hey, we're going to do positive, we're going to support positive climate works with the selling of the NFT. Cool. That, that really explains it well. Um, tell us about uh, what you see yourself doing in sometime, you know, 10 years out in the future. I'm going to have my own house, my own land. I'm going to be growing fish. <laughs> and I, I think I'll be on uh, webinars a lot less often. I've and doing less of these videos. I've since felt much more inclined to just kind of pull in a little bit, um, like Wendell Berry a little. Uh, <laughs> okay. So that's what I, I imagine you'll see less of me on the internet. <laughs> Well, and you know that the, the uh, Thoreau, um, Walden, Pond, you know, the, were the precursors to Wendell Berry. You know, yeah. incredibly well known and famous today. And frankly, they they spent a lot of their lives contemplating, you know, and really laying back and not being out in the public eye. So, 
It's, yeah. it's not a bad thing to think about. Unfortunately, I've never gotten to that place. I, I'm one of these type A personality, you know, um, that, that always has to be doing something. And it's not even often comfortable for me to, to just sit back. So anyway, um, audience, give us some questions. You guys have been really quiet, but you've been hanging out and listening. So that's cool. I'm watching. But please throw in some questions. We've got about 20 minutes left here. Um, are there any of these these images on your Instagram page, which is very cool, by the way, that you'd like to talk about um, or give us some thoughts on, Alexander? I guess that one that was just clicked, that was the event that I had briefly mentioned earlier. It was the first thing we did to announce our marketplace. Um, and we just got, um, we had invited people from different spaces like Soil and Director Capra. So Klaus Lackner, that professor I had mentioned, who was like the start of this whole journey for me, he's actually um, an official advisor to Nori, um, and he came uh, from the Direct Air Capture space. Thanks for the like. Um, and uh, uh, we had, you know, people within regenerative agriculture, forestry, had people from corporations that buy offsets. Um, and this was actually this photo was when we were when we were working from a living room. That was Nori HQ original, and it was our one of our co-founders uh, just dining room table. That happened for like six months. It was a true true entrepreneurial venture, um, but we all just thought we were crazy enough to do this. So uh, then we put together this big event and had people come and provide some pretty honest feedback on the white paper that we had shared um, about like what we were trying to build and the marketplace, and people were very, kind in their criticisms because they understood they were that we're just trying like we don't have all the answers we're sh trying to share an idea and get back feedback to make the thing better and so i think that's actually one that I'll, I'll say that just in general when it comes to climate change and sustainability and innovation um i don't know what's up with society now like just being so quick to judge and say like oh well you think this and i and i'm not really reacting so much within nori uh, but i see it like we criticize across the way and and point fingers as opposed to saying like hey have you considered that there might be this implication and if you're trying to achieve this goal here's another like another solution i think the other person would or the other party might respond like hey yeah that that might be more useful so um we found that in our work it's super helpful when we share transparently what we're thinking in our methodology in our documentation and then people can read it and say like hey uh that doesn't work for this reason um uh, and then, you know, become part of the conversation to improve uh, the development of whatever it is that we're trying to do, which is remove carbon from the atmosphere. Awesome. So do you have any events planned in the near future that, that would be um, ones that we could talk about? Not not Nori events. Um, we're so busy <laughs> just trying to grow the, the company and the marketplace and launch this token. Uh, we are thinking to do an event soon um, once that once we've launched our token. Um, but um, we will. Our, one of my co-founders, Jason, will be speaking at NFT.NYC in New York at the beginning of November, and I'll probably go to New York to do that as well. Um, and then in the, I mean, it's not really an event, but something that's fun that we've been working on is we're going to be announcing on the first of October. A partnership with Greenfeet. Greenfeet is this great company um, that helps organizations to estimate their carbon footprints. So we help sell offsets, but we get a lot of customers asking us, okay, well, how much do we buy? And we're like, we don't own. Uh, we can't help you there. So we found a partner, Greenfeet, that actually does that. They, um, you know, will help you gather the information, make it really simple for you to figure out how much is your organization responsible for emitting carbon every month and every year, and then um, pairs that with um, reduction technologies as well as Nori carbon removal offsets. Cool. Um, looking down the road again, that out 10 years, that land you're going to buy and the farm you're going to have, will it be down there in the south? Or is it, what have you thought ahead that we're in the country you'd like to have? I, well, I gotta do some research on the projections of sea level rise here because it's a real thing. I don't know that we'll be able to avoid it. Um, it'll probably be here though, uh, if the rate of increase in sea level rise is still quite at the pace that it is now, because um, my family is here and I'm very much attached to my family structure now. So 
Um, also, Latin America calls me too. There's a lot in South America that I just found really beautiful, and I love the culture. So, so. yeah. How about again? You're you are a Cuban American, and how about going back to Cuba at any point? Would things have to change dramatically politically, or what? Yeah, for sure. Like that's a tough one because um, you know we still can't spend U.S. dollars um, in Cuba, and it'd just be really difficult. But I love Cuba. I've been there. Um, and it's lovely, and I still have some very, very distant family there. But yeah, unfortunately, Cuba's out out for me. I mean, it's too difficult. <laughs> it, it's not a you know a colonomic topic necessarily, although we usually say. Because economics is anything that you do that makes a little money making the planet better. So it's really broad. I mean, it just could fit all over. And we kind of say the only things that are probably not within the realm of that are things like sex trafficking or, you know, there's, there's a very limited number of subjects. But um, in today's world, there's a lot of discussion about um, a, the, the kind of uh, – reparations and other things needed for people who have been uh, discriminated against that are immigrants and and that are not americans and your parents are immigrants do you did you remember from your childhood discrimination that worked in a in a way that was not good for you and your family and how would your parents necessarily maybe react to that what are some things that we should be doing different as it relates to immigrants I really appreciate you asking the question and that there's an awareness and that you ask the question and you give some space to that. To be honest, I, I am fairly white um, in my appearance and so I have not had any, and I grew up here, um, so I have not had any like racial discrimination. Um, I would say it's, you know, discrimination on the, on the basis of my sex all the time. It's still very frustrating. Um, but it's helpful that people will, uh, like you just have an awareness and acknowledge in this space. And that's the practice. It's really just a continuous practice of like acknowledging that these things have happened, checking in with each other, but not letting it define us or, or uh, you know, determine what we can or cannot do uh, or others can or cannot do. Um, and then just continuously have that conversation and practice and hopefully uh, move on and evolve beyond these things. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, my my family has, and these are real issues, and I appreciate that people are having these conversations, and um, hopefully it'll get better and better every day. They need to eliminate. Yeah. Um, just because you mentioned it, what was the last thing you remember that where you you, you encountered some discrimination as being a woman? You know, my, you asked my wife, and I guarantee she could tell you two or three that she remembered. <laughs> It's like subtle, it's so funny, it's like subtle things, subtle things that just drive me crazy. Like, um, you know, so, you know so, for example, I won't name names. We're, 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 a while back we were doing a hiring process and um, we were looking for an engineer. And I remember asking one of my colleagues, what were the things that needed to be on that job description? Because I was ha managing the process. And they said, um, it needed to, the the engineer needed to have I think it was Node JS which is a a back um, a back end uh, JS framework and JS stands for JavaScript and JavaScript is a front end thing like JavaScript is what created most of what we're looking at in TypeScript and so there are all these different things of JS and I remember my other colleagues saying oh here's a great resume we should we should screen them I said no they don't have JS uh, Node JS oh but they have JavaScript. I understand, but they don't have Node.js, so they're not qualified as a backend engineer for this. No, 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 it's all the same. No, it's not, I said. And they insisted, yes, it is. It's just different libraries, the same thing. They're very different in syntax, like completely different. It would take, and, and what you think and how you think, it's just different skills. So, um, but me being kind of always, uh, more prone to acknowledge that, hey, maybe I don't know, like, if you're going to push that hard on me, like, I probably don't, maybe you're right, fine, I'm going to take it, um, and we went back to the original person that had told us, and he's like, no, this doesn't work, because that they don't have no GS, and the other guy's like, oh, no, but aren't they the same, and he's like, no, they're very different, and I'm just like, blown, why didn't you hear what I was saying, I know, because I, 
I, I played around for a while and then I like, taught myself these languages and I've done courses in them and I'm not I'm no pro and I probably couldn't write it like a code now, but I'm familiar with the context of them. So simple things like that, where just because it's coming from this face, yeah. they're like, no, you yeah. don't have to talk about it. I'm like, dude, they're different. <laughs> so. By the way, um, I don't think we've ever done this on a webinar, but I'm gonna have a read because I think he's running the screen right now do this. Arib, on this website, um, left, right click on the, um, on the tab, and then I want you to go to view page source down at the bottom. So go way down, there it is. This is showing everyone the code that is used to, to, to develop this page. And there is JavaScript in it. By the way, I am not a coder at all. My wife is. My wife was yeah. one of the original sort of web designers back way back. And, and so I don't know enough to know what the difference with the, the JavaScript versus no JavaScript. But just to show people, because a lot of people don't even know that this is there. Um, yeah. We use it sometimes because we want to see what underlying um, web source was used for web pages. So um, it'll say WordPress, for example, in, in places on web pages. And, we use a, a platform called Kajabi and it'll say Kajabi. I, I know enough to look within the code to see you know, to be able to read that. But a lot of people don't even know you can do that and see what the code is on a web page. So, anyway, sometimes they do that and I'm like, oh. yeah, sometimes yeah. they do that. I'm like, oh, I like that landing page. Can I see what they use? And I go, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you just, just right, just right click and then go to view page source. My wife taught me that one a long time ago. Um, yeah. So we're getting close to the end here. I still don't see some questions from the audience. You guys are being unbelievably shy. Your web page is so very well done, by the way. Um, give us give us some last thoughts, Alexander, from yourself that you'd like to impart to an audience that that is people that care about the planet and want to be entrepreneurs as it relates to it. So that's why we say make a little money making the planet better. And so yeah. give, us, give us some last thoughts. Well, hmm, you can, lots of, lots of call to actions here. So um, if you want to take action, you feel like you haven't really felt confident or, or, or know how to take action on your carbon footprint, um, pay for removing carbon and supporting farmers in this work. Um, it does more than just remove CO2 from the atmosphere. It helps to spur a whole economy where farmers can switch over their practices that are more to much more regenerative, which means that they can restore soil and land, which means that we have a stronger, more resilient food supply chain. Um, you can do that at nori.com. It's very, very simple. Just enter in your credit card information, how much you want to buy, um, et cetera. Also, if you're, in, um, if you're a business and you're looking to, uh, to do this, uh, please also send us an email. There's a for business page up there. Happy to talk about how to do this for businesses. If you just want to listen and learn more, um, my colleague Ross, uh, we're currently on a pause right now, but there are at least 150 episodes of our Reversing Climate Change podcast, um, which is really fantastic. We have really cool guests, so I would I would say check that out. Um, and with regard to being entrepreneurs, there's actually a group called Air Miners that I really love and totally support. They are a group of entrepreneurs in this space too, but they focused on actually, um, they were entrepreneurs doing their own solutions and then they came together and created Air Miners, which is just a community base for anybody interested in the carbon removal climate tech space. Um, and there they go. Um, and they host uh, events and webinars and Slack and even like they have like workshops and, uh, and like boot camps so you can learn about carbon removal, they're great. So I highly recommend them if you're like trying to get into this and you want to meet more entrepreneurs, maybe a potential co-founder, uh, I would I would have come to this space and, and join the community. By the way, what great info, this is awesome. By the way, and thank you for complimenting Areed. He and Mark are awesome at doing what they're doing in the background on websites. Yeah. They, don't get, they, don't, they don't get a lot of uh, Acknowledgement from that from our audience or, or from our speakers. So I appreciate that. Um, no, this was great. Thank you so much, guys. I really liked that. He was just on hand and flowing through the through the images. It's great. And and we have a question here from the audience. So I'm going to put that on here. Um, Aloha from uh, from Maui. My partner and I are beginning a regenerative farm and are curious about suggestions 
you may have for a farm that is in its infant stages during the establishment phase. So I think it, you know they, they they're just getting it started. So what would you say to them? Um, I don't know that I have anything to offer other than to read uh, David Montgomery's books. Um, are you familiar with David Montgomery? He's I am, yeah. yeah. Um, or or just get in that space. I'm honestly I'm not the, the expert on the soil side. Um, I know enough to understand and appreciate the science of, of what's happening um, ecologically. Uh, but when it comes to farming practices, I'm not can't help you. But I appreciated that there was a question. <laughs> Yeah, by the way, I'm going to look and see here who asked this. And I'm going to say that from our perspective, from each, we have thousands of hours of, of presentations because we do two kinds of presentations here. One, we do one-off interviews with people like Alexandra. And then we ask people to do courses for us. So those courses could be anywhere from the shortest we've ever had is three hours to the longest being Mark Shepard's, who's over... 150 hours so we did 150 different sessions mark shepherd would be somebody that i'd highly recommend that you look into from a regenerative farm obviously recently we've really focused on holistic farm management and alan savory and we've probably had what marker we've six or seven sessions already now with different speakers abby smith was our most recent one you might want to listen to her. I mentioned Elaine Ingham earlier with soil science, um, but you can find all these on the EAT community, and, um, and there's free membership to the EAT community. There's a paid membership. We're not trying to advertise here, but there are a lot of free sessions you can get from us where you can learn. So, um, well, we are getting right at the top of the hour. I hope that was helpful for the answer to your question. Um, and it was Darlin that, that asked. So thank you, Darlin. It's a great question. And this has been awesome, Alexandra. I hope we can talk again another time, maybe even have some of your co-founders come on with us for, boy, anytime you want, recommend speakers to us. Interestingly, that's our biggest challenge. We don't get as many amazing speakers as we like. When we get them, they almost always are amazing, like you've been. But we'd like to do five or six of these a week, and we do two or three now. So um, and we were at the point, we took a little bit of a break in 2020, and we had gotten up to where we were having 10 to 12 a week in 2019. And so we, we don't want, that was too many, that was too many, but we want to get back up to five or six again. Yeah. Sure. This was a pleasure. Um, Thank you so much for the time. It was a nice way to end the Friday. Yeah, and uh, go have some fun for the weekend. The same thing for the whole audience. And Mark and Arif, thank you. You guys are awesome as always. Why don't you take us out? Bye.